Hello, this is Emetic Hipster and welcome to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be going over the fascinating history and iconic tradition of the religious celestial chorus. These faithful awaken draw their powers from the Divine One and channel it through their holy songs, prayers, acts of devotion and the good book. Speaking of a good book, I have a whole section on the Celestial Chorus in my mage book for sale on the Storyteller's Vault, where new backgrounds give choristers powerful abilities when combating evildoers, or just those that generally disagree with them, in the world of darkness. It also has a whole host of merits and flaws, including playing members of heretical sects, an isolated hermit, or even an ex-faithful who has lost their belief altogether. Alongside these rules, there are merits and flaws for eight other traditions. If you're able to pick up a copy, you are not just supporting the channel and myself, but also getting something for yourself, hopefully to inspire you in your games of mage. Of course, if you're unable to get the book, I still hugely appreciate you dropping by and listening to my videos, and your support means the world to me and the channel. With that out of the way though, let's get into it and look at the tradition of choir boys or bloodthirsty but zealots, depending on who you ask. These are the Celestial Chorus. The group known in modern nights as the Celestial Chorus are essentially defined as a religious awakened group who believe that their power, and indeed all human agency and belief, comes from a being they define as the One. They are in modern nights a very broad church and draw their members from traditionally Abrahamic religions, with Islamic, Jewish and Christian mystics making up the core of the tradition. They do have many other members, however, from other world religions, and even polytheists who see the diverse gods of their pantheon as faces and facets of the singular one. They even have what we might consider dead religions, such as worshippers of Mithras, the deity not the vampire, or the famous Cathars. As unified as this central idea of a broad umbrella of the one seems, the history of the celestial chorus is anything but unified. As Christianized as the modern chorus seems, its roots go back much further than Christianity or even the Abrahamic religions. Like many awakened, they draw their origins and heritage from a mythical age, with heroes such as Gilgamesh and Enoch being among their number. This is where we get the theme of song originating, and the one representing a singular song of reality with all of creation in harmony with one another. The earliest historical group linked to the chorus are from ancient Egypt, with the monotheistic Amonhotep IV, who created the city of Thebes and gathered other monotheistic awakened groups together as the first singers. A significant early group of listeners are the chosen of Abraham, who are clearly Jewish in origin. After monotheism grew as a concept, these singers largely grew along similar lines, mostly confined to the fertile present North Africa and the Middle East, with its powers waxing and waning and the very groups working together to greater or lesser degrees. The next great leap forward for divinely inspired mages was the foundation of the messianic voices shortly after the birth of Christ, in the wake of the great explosion of faith that happened after this event. Made up mostly of Jewish and Greek converts, the group became influential within the Roman Empire, and though not exclusively Christian, Christianity became a driving force within the movement. This group's main rivalry at the time was actually a very similar monotheistic cult, the Sons of Mithras. The rivalry culminated in the Battle of the Melvian Bridge, where Emperor Constantine's victory and sponsorship of Christianity saw Christianity's rise to dominance in the Roman Empire, causing the Sons of Mithras and Mithratic worship in general to have to go underground. This event also caused other non-Christian faiths within the chorus to become marginalized, this is really a point where divinity-based awakened move from being spiritualists, largely keeping their influence to spiritual or community matters, to becoming a powerful political force. It also expands monotheistic religion and the paradigm of the divine to many other cultures as the Roman Empire waxes and then wanes. Even within the empire, you gradually begin to see minor sects or different ways of seeing the one becoming homogenized, and the Middle East and North Africa becoming safe havens for the more diverse sects that are largely outside of the Roman Empire. The next large event will be the growth of Islam, a religion that grew out of Judaism much like Christianity, and although it did cause a great spread of the monotheistic paradigm, 
it also brings further disunity between the followers of the One, leading to more conflict between these groups as the politics of Awakens become intrinsically aligned with the religious belief. Islam is often an understated part of the celestial chorus in modern nights, and this era of Christian dominance is often part of that, when in reality Islamic and Jewish voices were always large minorities within the group, and in modern nights are happily on par with their Christian colleagues. Great wealth and power is given to the messianic voices within Christianity, further shifting balance of power away from the Middle East and towards Europe, with events like the Crusades, and the East-West Schism, further centralizing this. I won't go into, into the specifics of the events of this period, but it's time to say that Messianic voices found themselves ascendant, and as most awakened groups do when they find themselves in a position of unrivaled power, went around crushing their opponents, with battles between Messianic voices and the El Abitan, the Bina, and the Order of Hermes being easily as brutal as the modern Ascension War. The Messianic voices became largely victims of their own success. Their power base began to turn upon itself, leaving them vulnerable to outside attack when the Order of Reason started and then continued their extreme persecution of all non-centralized mindsets and the beliefs, beliefs the Messianic voices had started. The Messianic voices members who saw the corruption and extremism within their own organization reformed in the celestial chorus around the time of the founding of the traditions, hoping to leave behind the more divisive politics that had characterized the organization for nearly a thousand years. And they formed alliance with their old enemies, the Vibana, the al Batan, and the Order of Hermes, as well as codifying that the group was now open to different beliefs and faiths, and all were welcomed. One of the founding members of the tradition's great efforts to bring faith-based awakened it back into their ranks and to support marginalized groups against their old allies in the cabal of pure thought began to rebuild the trust in them. This new celestial chorus grew in strength from its diversity and its non-Christian membership began to give it strength and a breath of fresh life. This alongside new priorities meant that instead of internal struggles over doctrine that were, put, were now put aside and a renewed focus on combating the order of reason and nefandic influences gave this group the ability to adapt and thrive well into the modern nights. In the 21st century, the Celestial Chorus still have internal bickering over theological ideals and nuances, but in general it's become a literal broad church that has become more focused on the good in a moral sense than the wars that mar its bloody history. The paradigms of the Celestial Chorus vary much more than you might expect, but often come down to faith, actions or knowledge, meaning that the universe, and particularly the One, grant you your miracles. Within this, other foci are extremely varied, and more often than not based on real world religions. There is an interesting focus on singing, chanting, and other vocalizations as a focus for the choristers, and this is often an interesting idea to incorporate into your character. They hold the seat of prime within the Council of Nine, and very few choristers would not have at least some skill in that sphere. Having great skill with prime makes the choristers experts at interacting with the raw substance of magic and many see Prime as a manifestation of the One. The Prime also makes them quite rightly particularly capable enemies of the less savoury denizens of the world of darkness. Imbuing your effects and weapons with Prime energy to cause ag damage makes this group particularly feared among the Garu, Changeling spirits and especially vampires. The Sphere of Prime also allows them to imbue magical effects into mundane objects and even people, allowing them to perform iconic effects like holy water, blessings and consecrations. Choristers have a particularly tangible set of foci for the most part, and I recommend choosing religious practice and simply running with it. What I wouldn't do is to be too general though, and really get specific with your research in your particular denomination or group. Even monolithic organizations like the Orthodox Church, Catholic Church, Orthodox Judaism, or the two large sects of Islam have many derivatives who approach their faith in slightly different ways. In fact, choosing a minor group often will provide you with a more concise set of principles and practices to hone in on. And learning about groups like Sufi Muslims, English Levelers, Igbo Jews, or Christian Desert Fathers is often a fascinating exercise in of itself. It also goes without saying that if you're choosing a real world faith, make sure your table is comfortable with it and do your research to explore that faith, beliefs, and traditions. If you feel even slightly uncomfortable with what you've chosen, I would suggest backing off, as people's heartfelt beliefs are not things to be taken lightly. 
Alternatively, the Correctors have a deep wealth of faiths that are not currently practiced to choose from, and choosing the worshippers of Mithras, Minoism, or my own personal favourite, Cathars. There's often quite good historical records on these group practices, as well as fictionalised depictions that you can draw from. Whatever you choose, use it as a learning opportunity to explore a faith, and make your portrayal of that faith honourable and accurate. They are also one of the few mystic awakened groups that have a large influence over the consensus, and although most modern humans would still balk at obviously miraculous events, the vast majority of humans still follow a religion, and this gives great flexibility to the chorister's effects. When you do choose your foca, I would suggest seeing it as one of them, as not only it is important to many religious groups, but also quite cool and iconic for the tradition itself. I would avoid the true faith merit for your character, as it often leads to pretty unbalanced situations, and if you want a power representing your character's faith, the faith background in my new book, linked below, gives a good representation of faith-based powers. The Celestial Chorus have emerged out of a bloody and fractured history, from the very heights of power for a mystic group, to losing this paramount position, but regaining its soul, becoming wiser, more tolerant, and regaining its focus as driven religious mages. Thank you for watching my video on the Celestial Chorus. And if you want to help decide what the next group will be, please leave a comment below. If you'd also like to leave a like and a subscription, then I hugely appreciate your support for the channel. This has been the Hermetic Hipster, and thank you for watching.